All right, well, uh, good morning. We'll go ahead and uh, get started this morning. Um, hope everybody's had a uh, great week and uh, appreciate you being back this morning as we continue on in our class on uh, how to read and interpret Scripture. Uh, Lee's got some handouts that he's uh, passing out. I don't have a PowerPoint this morning. I, uh, I was out of town for three days this week and kind of had a busy, stressful week. And so um, I was pushed for time at the end of the week when I had to get back and get caught up at, at work and family and everything. So um, I just did a simple little outline of the tips uh, to help us interpret these uh, genres that we're talking about. Um, and then you feel free to use that page to jot down notes throughout the, you know, the margins and everywhere else if you want to. But uh, anyway, if you don't have an uh, outline, does everybody have an outline? Lee got? Okay. All right, good. All right, well, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to uh, bless uh, our time uh, this morning. Father in heaven, we are thankful today that you have given us another day of life. You've given us breath. God, you've allowed us to wake up and to be able to think, to hear and see and walk and talk. And God, we don't take that for granted. And Father, we thank you for the, for the opportunity, the freedom that we have to gather this morning together as the people of God, as the church. We thank you for our religious liberty right now to be able to do that. Father, I pray that our time this morning will be well spent. We just ask for your spirit to help us to illuminate our minds, to open our understandings, uh, Lord, so that we might be able to grasp, uh, Lord, these interpretive principles. And even when we look at examples and talk about uh, these rules in relationship to certain passages or texts, that you would just give us understanding and that your spirit would help us and equip us uh, today. May this be an edifying time. Lord, may uh, you be with me as I teach. Let it be clear and let it be precise. Father, let it be helpful. And Lord, I pray it all be done for your glory and for the good and edification of your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, uh, we have now for several weeks been in our interpretive steps uh, to uh, how to interpret the Bible well. And we're talking about, I guess you could say in these interpretive steps, the basic rules and the principles of um, the process of interpretation. And uh, we, for the last several weeks, have been talking about how to deal with particular genres of Scripture. Uh, I've been calling this Talking Scripture's Literary Lingo. Uh, we're learning how to talk the, the, the literary lingo of the Bible. Uh, part of us interpreting or reading well, interpreting well, is understanding the type of language we're hearing because even though we have one canon or one Bible, if you will, and it really is one big story, it is written in many different categories or forms of literature. And so we've been talking about how to recognize those different genres, how they work, and about the different rules of interpreting them if we're going to read and interpret well. So we've already talked about uh, the four major Old Testament genres. We've talked about historical narrative. We've talked about the Hebrew covenant law, Hebrew prophecy. And we talked about Hebrew poetry last week as well. This morning we're going to discuss the New Testament genres. And these will be primarily three. Uh, there is the genre we call gospel. There is the genre we call epistle or the letters. And then there's the genre of apocalyptic. Now, I have not included Acts as a particular genre on its own in our study. And I'll just go ahead and say this. Um, if we really can grasp the principles and the rules for interpreting historical narrative, like in the Old Testament and even with the Gospels, then we pretty much kind of know how Acts is working. Uh, like the Gospels, it's got a theological purpose and it's also historical narrative reporting to us the advance of the gospel, the advance of the church. And so uh, just understand that uh, Acts is kind of a blend of, of those two genres. But we'll look at gospel, epistle, and apocalyptic this morning. So first, let's just dive into the genre of gospel. 
and let's learn its uh, lingo. Now, there's a lot that we could say this morning. Uh, there's a lot of discussion we could have about the gospel genre. Uh, we could include in our discussion things like why there are only four gospels, um, which order were they written in, the dates they were written in, how they're interdependent, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke upon each other, who used who and who used this one as a source and that one as a source and, and all those kind of things. And we, we don't have time to, to do that. I want to look at specifically what this genre is and how it works and how we can take the interpretive uh, steps to helping us interpret it well. So let's talk for a moment about the nature the features and the functions of the gospel genre. How does this work? Well, first of all, we've got to ask the question, what is a gospel? Now, I don't mean what is the gospel. Okay, I hope you were clear on that. But what is a gospel? What type of literature is Matthew and Mark and Luke and John? Well, quite honestly, there's nothing really like it before it in the Bible. It's really a unique genre. Uh, there's nothing really like it. Even in that day, uh, you had things like biographies, historical narratives, historical reports, those kind of things. But the gospel is not just those things. Oh, it, it does tell us about who Jesus is and what Jesus did, right? It does give us historical facts about Jesus' life. We know things about the regions he was in and the people he ministered to and miracles that he did and things he taught. So there is that historical element, that reporting element to the Gospels, but they're very unique and because that's not all that they're interested in. Uh, they take a different approach. For instance, the Gospel writers are not interested in telling us or giving us an exhaustive account of everything that Jesus said and did. John said that at the end of his Gospel. Remember that? He said, I I've written these things to you, Right, so that you may believe. But there are many other things that Jesus said and did that I cannot put all in this one volume. As a matter of fact, all the books in the world, he says, could not contain all the things that Jesus said and did. Each of these four evangelists is very selective in what they include in their gospel account. They don't just tell us everything. And not only that, but they arrange and adapt the material to fit their theological purpose for their targeted audience. So, for instance, you'll have things that Mark tells us that maybe Matthew doesn't tell us, or things that John tells us that Luke doesn't tell us. So they, have, they are very selective in what they give us. And not everything they tell us, historically speaking, is even chronological. You know, you might read Mark's account of this and then go read John's account of this and you think, well, that doesn't seem to be chronologically the same. That's not their purpose. Uh, they're not just giving us a historical timeline, moment by moment, event by event, from beginning to end. That's not what this type of genre is about. They strategically placed the stories, the events, the teachings that they did, where they did, for theological emphases. It's all a part of their strategic plan. Let me give you an example. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of those, we call them the synoptic gospels. They're very, very similar in what they include, although somewhat different or have a little different angle here and there. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all place the cleansing of the temple. Remember when Jesus went in and drove out the money changers? Remember, and he kind of wrecked the temple and he said this is to be a house of prayer and that whole temple cleansing event. They place that at the end of Jesus' ministry and therefore at the end of their narrative, somewhere toward the end of their narratives. However, John places it at the beginning of his account, like in the second chapter that we have. Now, some scholars would say, well, maybe there's two cleansings. Maybe there was a cleansing at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and then there was a temple cleansing at the end of Jesus' ministry. And that's very possible. It could be that uh, there was a later cleansing that happened, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, that John did not include for his purposes. It could be that there was an earlier cleansing of the temple, like John has, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't see fit to give it to us. But more, li more likely, or most likely, there probably was just one temple cleansing. 
But John arranged it, and it probably was at the end of his ministry, Jesus' ministry. But John arranged it as he did in his narrative because of one of the major themes or motifs that he wants us to get or his readers to grasp about Jesus. John is very bent on the fact of showing us not only that Jesus is God, but that He is God in the flesh. He says in chapter 1 that He was in the eternal presence of God. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then he says in chapter, later in chapter 1 that the Word, or God the Son, tabernacled among us. That's Old Testament language from Exodus about God dwelling with His people. He tabernacled or He he made His temple among us. And so in chapter 1, He is setting up the fact that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He is the very presence of God come here in this world in the flesh. But in chapter 2, after Jesus goes in and cleanses the temple and the Pharisees are outraged at what He's done, And they say, who's given you the right and the authority to do this? This is what Jesus said. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it back up. And then John tells us. He gives us a little interpretive clue about what Jesus was talking about. He said he was speaking of his body. In other words, John is wanting us to see that Jesus is the true temple of God. He is the dwelling place of God. He, the, the, the presence of God inhabits in Him. He is the habitation of God's presence here among us. And what John wants us to see throughout his gospel, right there from the beginning all the way through, is that Jesus is the fulfillment and, and also the replacement or displacement of the temple. There is no more need of the physical temple because Jesus is the temple. And so you have this language of fulfillment that Jesus not only fulfills the temple, He fulfills the temple sacrifices. He is the Passover lamb, right? He also is the fulfillment of all the festivals and rituals that go along with the temple. Like the festival of booths and the the, the different feasts. So John arranges it at the beginning for a theological influence. So here's what the Gospels are in essence. They are biographies of sort, but they are theological biographies. They're not written according to the standard biographies of our day, given just a chronological timeline and all these historical facts. They have a theological purpose, a theological agenda. You could say that they are the theological memoirs of the apostles as they remember and record and retell the oral traditions of what they had seen and heard and had been told. They tell the story of Jesus for theological and discipleship purposes. That's what the Gospels are. Also, each Gospel was written for that theological purpose mainly to tell us who Jesus is. If you want to know the ultimate point of every single Gospel account, it's who is Jesus and what has He done? For instance, some of the Gospel writers give it to us very plainly. John says in John 20, 21, I have written all this down for you so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him you may have life in His name. He tells us the purpose of His entire gospel right there. Luke tells us the purpose of his gospel. Uh, Listen to Luke as he begins his gospel account in Luke 1, 1 through 4. He said this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. In other words, Luke says, look, I've researched this. I've visited with this eyewitness. I've heard this from this eyewitness. I've I've, I've made sure that I've done careful uh, research and analysis of everything and spent time with people. And I've recorded all of this for you, Theophilus, so that you would have certainty that what you've been taught and what you've heard about Jesus is absolutely right. There's his purpose. So the main purpose of every gospel is to tell us or reveal to us 
who Jesus is. And one of the chief ways that the gospel writers do this is by presenting and proving that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures and messianic hopes and promises. So over and over again in the gospels, in their own ways, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are telling us who Jesus is and they're constantly either quoting or alluding to or echoing events and things that were said and done in the Old Testament to help us understand that this is the promised one. Something else you need to know about the Gospels is each Gospel has two settings that we have to be mindful of. The first setting is what I call the Jesus setting. We have to be somewhat familiar and keep in mind the context of Jesus. The context He was born in and lived in and died in. You have to be mindful of His context, the Palestinian geography of the day. Because the Gospels, right, talk to us about Jesus being in Nazareth and Jesus being in Galilee and Jesus going down to Jericho and all these different geographical places. You have to be mindful of the culture and the customs of Palestinian Jews. Jews in the land of Palestine at that time. There's also the, the context of Sim Second Temple Judaism. That is, there were things that had begun to develop between what we call the Old Testament and New Testament, that time in between, late B.C., right? The late centuries B.C. up until the time of Jesus. And after the temple had been rebuilt, that Second Temple Judaism had certain interpretations, ways they read and understood the Old Testament Scriptures, their messianic expectations, and all of their religious customs. We've got to be mindful of that. And also, of course, we've got to remember the context that Israel was in the land, but they were under Roman rule. We have to be mindful a little bit of the Roman Caesars, the Roman rulers and governors. I mean, they tell us about Herod. They tell us about uh, Caesar Augustus. Remember, Luke starts off telling us that about Caesar Augustus and Quirinius and, and how they, they, made a, they wanted a census and all these things. It's all in the context of the Roman Empire. So there's the Jesus setting the setting of his time and life and ministry. But then there's also the evangelists and their audiences setting. That is, the evangelist and who they were writing to and the setting at that time. Because the evangelist didn't write immediately after the Christ event. They wrote most likely several, several years later, several decades later. If Mark was the earliest one written, you're talking about probably late 50s, or, or mid-50s somewhere in there, possibly. I mean, you're talking at least maybe 15 to 20 years at the very earliest. So you've got to be mindful of they're in a context. Where were these evangelists? Who were they writing to? Oftentimes their specific audiences that they wrote to were not as familiar with the Jesus context necessarily. Sometimes they were writing to more Jewish people. Sometimes they were writing to people that were a little more familiar with the Greco-Roman context. But you've got to know that the gospel writers wrote to specific people. They had a specific audience in mind. Another thing we need to be thoughtful about regarding the gospels is this. All four gospels focus on the concept of the kingdom of God. Now we talked about this several weeks ago, right? How the kingdom is sort of a unifying theme from beginning to end. Well, the Gospels announce the kingdom and talk to us about the kingdom more than any other place in Scripture. The kingdom that the Old Testament anticipates or anticipated and that the Jews, even at the coming of Jesus' time, were expecting. I mean, they were, they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the Davidic King. They were looking for the, the coming of the kingdom at that time. The gospel writers understand that the kingdom arrived with Jesus. His coming and the coming of the kingdom are simultaneous. His life and death and resurrection inaugurated the kingdom. However, even though it's been inaugurated, it's not been fully consummated. 
So the gospel writers understand this concept, as does Paul in the epistles, that we're living now in the, the church. Those who have been saved, who live on this side of the resurrection, have the Spirit of God. We live in the already, not yet. The kingdom is already here, right? Jesus brought it. He was doing the works of the kingdom. He tells us to live by the principles or the ethics of the kingdom. We're to do the work of the kingdom. The kingdom is here. It's advancing, but it's not fully consummated. So for instance... In the Gospels and in the Epistles even, we see now in this already not yet that sin has already been atoned for and forgiven. But yet there's coming a day when sin will be finally done away with completely and abolished forever. Satan has already been defeated through the work of Jesus Christ, through His death and resurrection. Yet there is coming a day when Satan will be bound and abolished and banished forever in the lake of fire. Or... Jesus has already brought peace and righteousness for His people, right? We already have victory. We have peace with God. We have the righteousness of Christ. But yet there is coming a day when that will be fully consummated, when we will experience that righteousness fully without sin and there will be peace and vindication for God's people. We have to be, keep that in mind as we read the Gospels, that there's this already not yet aspect of the kingdom. All right, so what are some interpretive tips for us in reading and interpreting the Gospels? I've got them for you there on your outline. First, the Gospels are meant to be read as wholes, not just individual and isolated stories. There is a grand theme and a grand purpose that each evangelist had for his Gospel account. And when we read the Gospels, we're not to read them in this fragmented way where, you know, we just read story by story and piece by piece. We are to read them in light of the whole. We have to keep in mind what the overall purpose and theme of this gospel is. And every little story, every little narrative, right, every little event throughout the telling of this, that account has to be read in light of the whole account. Secondly, who Jesus is, is the main point of each gospel. I can't emphasize this enough. The gospels are not intended really to be a manual for us on how to live. Now, do they contain the teachings of Jesus? Absolutely. Are there things there about how we should live as God's people? Absolutely. But they're not first and foremost intended for us, right, as a manual for Christian living. They are intended to point us to Christ. So each story is ultimately causing us to ask this question. Who is Jesus? And what do we see as true or is true of Him right here in this passage we're studying? That means that we have to be careful not to allegorize or to spiritualize the stories that the evangelists are telling us. You know, sometimes people will read a story or they'll read an account in a gospel and uh, to make it preach, if you want to say it that way, they feel like they have to allegorize it and give it all this spiritual symbolic meaning if it's really going to hit home with people. But that's not, that's not good hermeneutics. That's not what the evangelist intended us to do. Well, let me give you an example. In Mark 6, 45 through 52 is the account where Jesus sends His disciples on ahead of Him in a boat across the sea. He stays behind. You remember that story? He sends them in the boat. They're out there. And it says that Jesus was spending time in prayer. And then He decided to walk across the water. And so here's the disciples. They're out here and there's a storm. There's a, there's a rough sea. They're in, they're, they're, there's a storm going on. And it says that he could tell they were struggling to try to keep everything afloat and, and to survive. And it says that Jesus began to, in the, in the middle of the night, he began to walk across the water. And it says that, when the, that he was just going to pass them by. He was just going to just walk right on past them. And the disciples are panicking. I mean, they think, you know, the, the life is fixing to come to an end. They're fixing to sink. They can't save themselves. They're going to die. And, they, and Jesus is walking by. I mean, He's just fed the 5,000. Just done a miracle. 
and they're panicking that Jesus can't help them. And so they cry out to Jesus and it says that He gets in the boat and the storm ceases. Everything becomes calm. And He tells us, Mark tells us, that the, that the disciples didn't understand. They didn't perceive. They didn't understand what He just did for the 5,000. In other words, Mark wants us to see that this is who Jesus is, but the disciples did not grasp who He is. They didn't understand His majesty and His power. There seems to be some Old Testament illusions here behind what Mark is doing. For instance, in Job 9 verses 8 and 11, Job is speaking poetically and he's talking about God, the creator of all things. And he says that God tramples the waves under his foot and that he passes by unperceived. I mean, that Mark is wanting us to get an echo here, right? There's an illusion there of what Job was saying. Mark is wanting us to see that this is God walking on the water. Jesus is God in the flesh walking on the water, trampling underfoot the waves of the sea, which only God can do. But also, there's another illusion to Exodus because when they cry out to Jesus, Jesus says to them, Take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. The it is I definitely is an allusion to Exodus 3 where God told Moses that his name was I Am. And then there's also that allusion to Exodus 34 when Moses requested to see the glory of God. And Mo God told Moses, you get over here behind the rock, right? And my glory will pass by. Mark has these Old Testament stories in mind. He wants us to hear their echoes. He wants us to see these illusions because what he is trying to do, he is not trying to tell us a story about how when we're in the storms of life, we should desperately cry out and Jesus will come and get in the boat with us and everything will be fine. That, that's not the point of what Mark is doing here. That's not what Mark wants us to see. He wants us to see the message here for us is that this is a revelation of Jesus, who He is, of His glory, that He is the God who tramples underfoot the waves of the sea. He is the God of wonder and majesty, the great I Am. And if He can feed the 5,000, He can stop the storm, and He can do all things. You see, He's the main point of, of it all. Thirdly, the main point of each narrative should be our main point and focus. Okay? We should make sure that we're getting the main point of each narrative and letting that be our focus. Quick example. In Mark chapter 2, you know the story where Jesus is in the house and there are great crowds that are coming to Him, right? He's been preaching, He's been healing. There's a great crowd, a great throng of people that are in the house and these men hear about Jesus being there and they bring a paralyzed man, a paralytic. They couldn't get into the house because it was so crowded, remember? And so they got up on the roof and they peeled back a part of the roof, making a hole in the roof, and they let the man down into the house, right? He's lying on the mat. They, they let the man down. And Mark tells us in chapter 2, Starting in verse 5, I want you to hear what Jesus said when He sees this taking place. It says, And when Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Here's the, here's the, climate, here's the key part. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's the, that's the key to interpreting the whole thing here. Who can forgive except God? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in His Spirit that they questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, He said to the paralytic, 
I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So what's the point? Well, I've actually heard people preach this, and they have preached on the subject of evangelism. That this text is about doing whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. Now, that's not a bad concept in itself, right? I mean, that's, we can't say that that's bad or evil or necessarily wrong, but is that Mark's point? Is that what Mark wants us to see? No, Mark wants us to see the answer to the Pharisees' questions. Who has the authority? Who can forgive sin but God? Point, Jesus is God and He has the power to forgive sins. That's the point of the narrative. Another thing we need to make sure that we understand is that the literary context is important for our interpretation. That is, how all the material or the passages are arranged, how they unfold, and how they're all linked together helps us arrive at the meaning. So we have to read a lot wider than just our narrative or story in the gospel. You have to see the unfolding and how it all works because sometimes clues to help us understand the meaning in our particular passage is also given to us in the surrounding context. Fifth, where there are direct commands that Jesus Himself gives for all of His people, those are non-negotiable. So for instance, when He talks about us loving our neighbor, when He talks about us being generous, denying ourselves and following Him, when He talks about you know, the Sermon on the Mount, those are direct commands that are universal commands for all of His people. However, there are other times when the Gospel writers are giving us stories or events that happened that are not necessarily meant to be a pattern or model for us necessarily. In other words, just because it's in the New Testament and it happened in the Gospels doesn't mean that it's necessarily directly applicable for us to repeat it or to have it as a model. Sixth, we're to note how the evangelists read backwards and we're to learn to read with them. What do I mean by that? We talked about this a while back, but after the Christ event... And Jesus had told them, all of the Old Testament is about me. So when they began to reread, if you will, Israel's scriptures, their scriptures, the Old Testament, and they began to write their gospel accounts, what they do is they are constantly either directly quoting, alluding to, or echoing the Old Testament to show us how the Old Testament prefigured Jesus and now He is the embodiment and the substance and reality of it all. And so we, like them, have to listen to those illusions. We have to be, have a keen sense of what, what things of the Old Testament are coming about here, or being alluded to here, being referenced to here, of how the Gospels want us to see and understand who Jesus is. Like we said a moment ago with Him walking on the sea. And then lastly, don't miss the importance of the already and not yet reality of the kingdom. We have to understand this concept when we read the Gospels. The kingdom is here, but it's not fully consummated yet. All right, second then. Let's talk about the lingo of the epistles, the genre of the New Testament letters. Here we're talking about the 13 letters of Paul. We're also talking about Hebrews, James, Peter, John, Jude, and even the book of Revelation. We'll talk more about it in just a minute, but... Revelation, right, is a letter. So it's included in these principles of interpretation. So let's talk for a moment about the nature and the function and the features of the epistles. Well, first of all, the epistles are not narratives. They are drastically different than reading Job, which is poetic language, or Jeremiah, which is prophetic language, or reading Judges, which is narrative language or genres. 
uh, when you read an epistle, you're reading a different kind of genre. Unlike the narratives, they're not necessarily telling a story. Unlike poetry, they're speaking in very direct, logical language. So when you read the epistles, you're reading direct discourse. You're reading logical, rational arguments. You're reading language that is, and reasoning that's very deductive, where they make a point and then they support that point and they come to conclusions and, and all of those things. And for this reason, this is probably, for most of us, the most simple genre for us to read and interpret. Because we still read letters today. We read arguments today. We read essays today that use this type of logical, deductive reasoning and direct discourse. However, these letters were specific documents written to specific people or churches about specific issues they were facing at a specific time. So even though they're very similar to types, the types of way that we read and, and, and reason today and talk today and write today, they're occasional. These letters were written because of a specific occasion that demanded that this author write this letter. Each letter was written with a specific purpose to that specific people. For instance, the letter to the Hebrews, or the letter of Hebrews, most likely was written to Jewish Christians who were facing the temptation to turn back to Old Testament Judaism. They had at least heard and at least, at least identified with the gospel in the New Covenant community. Some evidently were legitimate, genuine believers. Others, shown by their evidence, were not, but this was a community of people that were facing some oppression and, and, and opposition and they were thinking that it would just be more convenient and better to turn back to the old covenant way of things. And so this letter is an exposition and an exhortation. It reads like a sermon. There's parts where the writer is expounding the truth and then he exhorts them to respond a certain way. It expounds why Christ is better to the old covenant and that He is God's final word and final revelation. And then He exhorts them to not turn away, but to persevere. So in the letter to the Hebrews, you have all kinds of warnings and exhortations. Why? Because it's an occasional letter. It was written because of a certain occasion that faced these people and demanded that author to write that letter to those people at this time. And that's true of all the letters. Same thing true of Ephesians. Same thing true of Colossians. Same thing true of 1 John. Same thing true of the book of Revelation. So, with that said, and on, uh, on the heels of that, the epistles have a very particular historical and cultural context. And these letters are grounded in that historical context. If you read Paul's letter to the Colossians and have absolutely no idea at all to the historical context and setting behind that letter, that letter is not going to make very much sense to you at all. The historical context is what grounds that letter and the content of that letter, and it makes it objective for us. It can't just mean anything because it meant something to a particular people at a particular time facing a particular situation. Some of these contexts were more Jewish. Some of these contexts were more Greco-Roman. For instance, when the writer of the Hebrews is writing to his audience, it was a lot more Jewish context. But when Paul writes to the Ephesians or the Thessalonians or the Corinthians, it's very much a more Greco-Roman context. And these Historical contexts have influences on the issues that are being addressed, on the language that's coming out from the author. For instance, let me give you one example, and I could give you many, but here's one example. In Ephesians, Paul uses language 
that's not so common in all the other letters that he writes. He uses the language over and over again. He, he either talks about this or references to it. He talks about spiritual beings in spiritual places. He talks about principalities and powers and rulers. and He talks about the forces of darkness and, and, and these upper realms of the heavens over and over and over again. He doesn't do that anywhere else except for maybe Colossians. And those two letters are similar. They're like sister letters to similar context. Why would Paul do that? Why is he doing that all of a sudden? It's because in Ephesus there was a, a great reverence for, a great interest in, and even a fear of spiritual powers in spiritual places. These people had been influenced, right, by this magic and cult-like context and culture. And, and they believed that these powers had power over them. And they actually had this fear that these, these powers could do something to them. And so what does Paul do? And you see this come out. Paul tells us that Christ has been exalted in the spiritual heavenly places above all rule and power and that we have been exalted and seated with Him in those heavenly places and that we have a spiritual armor for a spiritual battle. Why does he do that? Because of the context and historical situation that had caused him to write this letter. You see, when you understand the historical context, the letters start to make a lot more sense. Here's another thing about letters. Letters are meant to be read and interpreted as a whole. Like the Gospels. We don't just read piece by piece. We're to read them as a whole. Each word makes up phrases. Those phrases make up sentences. Those sentences make up paragraphs or units of thought. And they make up the whole letter. And so each smaller part, paragraph if you will, sentence or word, is a part of a larger literary context that we have to pay attention to. Every logical argument is going to have a structure and a flow to it. So when we're reading Paul rebuking the Galatians or expounding something to the Ephesians, we have to pay attention to those literary features that go along with a letter and an argument. We have to trace the argument. We have to look for key words. We have to look for transitions. We have to look for repeated themes or words. We have to, to note all of these things, the main point and the movements of what's being said and how it's being said. We even have to listen to the tone of the author. Have you ever gotten an email or maybe you sent an email where whenever you wrote it and read back over it or you read the one somebody sent to you, you read it and you go, you know what? Based on the way they're saying what they're saying, I don't think this person is very happy. You ever sent one like that or read one like that? Because you can hear the tone of the author or the writer coming through. Paul has a lot of good things to say about the Philippians and he has a very rejoiceful or, or joyful attitude in writing. He is not happy with the Galatians. In fact, he's ticked off and his language is harsh. Also, something else you need to know about the Gospels is this. Or excuse me, the letters. Letters explain the Gospel and its implications more fully for us. Okay? In other words, they take the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, not only do they explain it more fully, but they even show us the implications of how it affects all of life. You could say it this way. The epistles explain and also apply the gospel to certain situations that arise within these churches. So what are some interpretive tips for us in reading and interpreting the epistles? First of all, read and be familiar with the letters as a whole. If possible, read the entire letter. Before you start digging in deep, read the entire letter in one to two settings. Some are a little bit easier to do that than others, but one to two settings. And preferably more than once do that. Read it many times before you even dig in. Because these letters, when they were sent to the churches... Not everybody got their own copy like you did your outline this morning and you can read over it. No, 
they were read in its entirety to the church publicly, audibly, so that people could hear it. So read it as one whole letter, like you would an email sent to you. Secondly, always ground the letter in its historical setting. No things like, who wrote it? Who were they writing to? Where were they writing from? What was the occasion behind the letter? That is, why did this author write this at this time? What was that church or those people like? What was their culture and customs like? What was going on with them and their context? That's all important. That's what grounds the letter and makes it objective. We can't just make it mean whatever we want it to mean because it's protected by the boundaries or the foundation of the historical context. Thirdly, look for the overarching theme and purpose of the letter. Ask these two big questions. What is this letter primarily about, more than anything else, that is? And why was this author writing this letter to these people? And usually, usually, the main theme and its purpose will come up over and over again. For instance, in Hebrews, the theme is Christ is superior or better than all the old covenant and it keeps coming up over and over again. In, in, in Galatians, the theme is we are counted righteous by God through faith and we are made His people by faith. That comes up over and over again. First Peter is about our living hope and our enduring inheritance that we have and that we can hang on to through times of persecution and opposition and oppressive situations. That hope and perseverance through trials comes up over and over again in Peter's letter. But the book of Revelation, the theme that Christ is sovereign over all powers and events and that we are to persevere in being faithful witnesses to Him and for Him because He will destroy all evil and reward His people. Those are themes in the Revelation that come up at the beginning of the letter, that keep coming up in the middle of the letter, and are mentioned again at the end of the letter. Fourth, pay attention to the literary context. Don't just look at that paragraph or that, that section right of text as it being there isolated all on its own. Ask what's been said, what's being said, and what's about to be said. In other words, look before that passage, look after that passage, and focus on what's being said in it and be aware of its surroundings. How does it all flow together? How does it all connect? What are the main points and movements and even the conclusions of what this person is writing about? And then fifth, Think paragraphs. You know, I told you with prophets, you think oracles, right? And the narratives, you think narrative units. Well, in epistles, you think paragraphs. You look for those transitions between the arguments. You think paragraphs and units of thought, and you ask this question. What's the author's point here, and why is he saying it here? What's his point and why is he saying it here? Sixth, don't miss the explanation and application of the gospel. I don't have time to get into this much, but note especially in, in the epistles, especially Paul. Paul works from an indicative to an imperative way of arguing things. What I mean by that is this. Paul, in most of his letters, will spend the first bit of his letter explaining the truth of the gospel, laying down the theological and gospel foundations. This is what God has done for us in His Son Christ. This is what is true of you in Christ. And then he begins to say, Okay, now this is how you are to live and behave. In other words, he grounds the imperatives, the ethical commands, right, for us on how we're to live and to behave and to respond, He grounds it in the gospel. He doesn't just give us moral commands. He grounds them in grace. And you've got to take note of that. Indicative, imperative. Therefore, we are to have a gospel-centered ethic. 
For instance, in Romans 14 and 15, there is evidently a rift and some tension between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in the church. They're having a hard time accepting one another and they're judging one another over matters of indifference, over gray areas like what food to eat. Is it okay to drink wine or not? Is it okay to, should you observe this special religious day or not? They're, they're, you know, one group's judging this group and the other group is looking down on this group and there's tension. And so what does Paul do? He calls them not to judge each other, not to censor one another on matters that are indifferent. Why? Because God has made us His people through Christ and we are to accept each other and not judge each other because Christ has accepted us. He grounds it in the gospel. We behave this way because He's explained the gospel. Seventh, be careful not to overextend applications of the author. In other words, before, even though the letters are most similar to us, and we can identify with them mostly because they were written on this side of the Christ event. They're under the new covenant. We're under the new covenant. They existed as the church. We exist as the church. There's lots of similarities, right? But we can't just make great leaps to say, well, okay, they're in the new covenant, we're in the new covenant, so what he said to them directly applies and is God's direct word to us. That's sometimes very dangerous. There needs to be, before we make direct applications to us from the text, there needs to be some direct parallels or particulars between that context and situation and our own context and situation. What I mean is this, and we'll have to, we'll have to stop because I know we've got to uh, finish on time, but there's a difference, right? There's a difference between something being creationally and morally conditioned, okay? That is, it's grounded in creation and in God's moral absolutes for all people in all places at all times. There's a difference between that and those things that are locally and culturally conditioned with that particular audience, and there are no parallels that exist. And I'll flesh this out real quick. For instance, when Paul condemns sins like homosexuality or murder or adultery, okay, and I'm just using three examples, in places like Romans 1, and in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and other places similar, when he condemns those type of things, he grounds these judgments, right, that they are sin and they deserve the judgment of God. He grounds them in the fact that they are creationally and morally wrong, right? That is, they're always wrong for all people in all places, in all cultures and times. They're not culturally conditioned. However, when you get to 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 and Paul is talking to the Corinthians about this issue of eating meat and drinking wine that's been sacrificed to idols, there's a difference. Because evidently there were Corinthian Christians that were struggling with going to these pagan temples and they were eating food that had been sacrificed and dedicated to false gods, right? They were participating in these sacrificial meals, and Paul says, you're participating with the demonic. And he says, therefore, in that context, going to a temple, right, and participating in those things, even though we know there are no other gods, he says to go to that temple and to participate in those things very well will and prob can and probably will destroy the faith of certain people. And he says, therefore, we don't need to do that. All right? Now, what we can't do is this. We can't say, oh, well, Paul says that he will in no way eat meat or drink wine if it causes the faith of another person to be destroyed. 
Therefore, today, I'm not going to eat a certain food or I'm not going to you know, drink wine or alcoholic beverage ever, whatever, because somebody, a, a, a jolly good Christian, will be offended at what I do. Now, there are people that take that text and that's the conclusion they come to. Paul says, I will in no way eat meat or I will in no way drink wine if it causes somebody else to stumble. But Paul is tying that conviction to a particular culturally conditioned occasional uh, situation with them going into the temple participating in idolatry and demonic activity. He's not saying, I will never drink wine or eat meat anywhere else ever. And so that would be a false step. That would be a, 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 a wrong leap from a particular situation that was occasioned in a particular in culture and jumping over to our culture. You can't do that. And, and the, the, the text won't allow us to do that. And, and other places in the, in the Bible won't even let us do that. There's not a direct parallel for us, right? I mean, if you choose to... Uh, participate in alcoholic beverages, that's fine. You go, to, you go eat a meal somewhere and you get a glass of wine, that's fine. We're not questioning, now did he, is he doing that and dedicating that to some false pagan god? It's not an issue. And of course we know that Jesus made wine. He came eating and drinking, right, with sinners. And even in the Lord's Supper, they drank wine, fermented wine, enough that if you drank, an, or so much so, if you drank enough of it, they were getting drunk in Corinth. So you've got to be careful that we don't overextend applications from the text to our day if there are not really close parallels and particulars. When there are not close parallels and particulars, we have to carefully, right, look for ways that we translate certain theological principles there into our context. And there's a big difference. We've run out of time. Next week, we'll, we'll pick up and look at uh, the apocalyptic genre uh, for a little while and, and, and move on and move on through. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and you would help us by your grace to continue to read and interpret Scripture well. Lord, help us to understand these rules and help us to practice them well. And Lord, let us love you and love your word more. Lord, bless our service, we pray. Be with Lee as he preaches. Lord, empower him by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.